It's the dawn of a new era. Or evening? Or noon? I don't know when you're watching this. A new era is dawning somewhere in the world. Welcome to Dragon Ball Dissection December for 2022, as we finally, fully make the jump into that most maligned of Dragon Ball series, Dragon Ball GT. Oh, you can't see me, but this is one of those rubbing my hands together moments. Yes, yes, it's so refreshing to take on a new challenge, to work through my own thoughts and impressions. There is a lot to talk about here, so let's not waste any time. The series opens from the perspective of unseen figures in a vehicle approaching Kamisama's temple. However, their voices might be familiar. As I talked about in my introductory video, producer Morishita Kozo spoke of seeking inspiration from the earlier parts of Dragon Ball. Fittingly, it's Pilaf, Shu, and Mai who are in the midst of another zany scheme to steal the Dragon Balls and take over the world. Ah, what a fun callback. It's enough to almost make me overlook that, once again, they shouldn't be able to simply fly up there in a rocket. Apparently, seeking inspiration from earlier stories didn't involve rereading the Piccolo arc. Despite these characters not having appeared since that whole wedding dress incident, episodes that aired seven years earlier, see, I've managed to switch gears so that I'm viewing this through the lens of the animated continuity, all three of their original voice actors returned for this cameo. Hey, at least Chiba Shigeru, Pilaf, had gotten Dragon Ball work over the intervening years as Raditz and non-movie Garlic Jr. It's obviously been many more years than seven within the continuity of the series, so these three have been redesigned to look extraordinarily old and pathetic. I particularly love the pronounced liver spots on Pilaf's head. Besides driving home that time has passed, it really sells this as a last-ditch effort for them, that they've managed to accomplish nothing in the intervening years. It's both a callback and a call forward, emblematic of what's to come. Just the fact that Shu and Mai have continued to stand by this little creep for all these decades, with nothing to show for it, speaks volumes about their characters. Don't you wish you had friends that loyal? Well, I guess they're minions. Eh, same thing, really. Through what appears to be an amazing coincidence for them, they arrive at a time when everyone is distracted. Following the events from the end of the last series, Goku has taken Oob here to spar, a showcase so powerful it threatens to topple the entire structure. And since Mai points out their sensors are picking up said power, I'm guessing Pilaf somehow pilfered Frieza technology at some point in the intervening years. But while this training makes their climb a little more difficult, it serves as the perfect distraction so that nobody notices their evil deeds. You know, not that a distraction should be necessary to keep them out. Goku and Oob exit, and it's immediately apparent that some time has passed since the last time we saw them. Five years have passed. Yes, five years. The 28th Budokai takes place in age 784, and GT takes place in age 789. I'm not at all sure where the idea originated that GT takes place 10 years later, but I swear I've seen it since the late 90s. Oob is a young man now, with a young man's vocal talents. Yes, he has been recast since his brief appearances in Dragon Ball Z the week before. I find that interesting given how it is typical in animated Dragon Ball to use the same performer for all stages of a character's life. That's certainly true for the character he's standing next to. However, I get the difference. We didn't really have much of a chance to connect Oob to his previous voice, so it's not terribly jarring to hear him sound different. Then again, Suzuki Tomiko, who had played Dende since the Frieza arc, was recast with Yuki Hiro at the very end of Dragon Ball Z, and he is continuing in the role here. That's odd, but at least we finally reached a consensus that Dende has grown up and is not going to randomly shrink again. And look, as long as Kusao Takeshi is playing Trunks as both a young man and scratchy-voiced child, I'll be happy. We did get that? Good. At any rate, Dende tells Mr. Popo to tend to their wounds. I guess being God means letting your servant do something that you could more easily do yourself with magic. Have I mentioned Dende sucks? Goku corrects Dende that this was not a graduation ceremony so much as Goku simply wanting to be able to fight all out with Oob. 
His Toriyama-mandated setup having now been paid off, Oob bids them farewell. I hope that was worth it. Say goodbye to Oob, everybody. We're not going to see him again for another 30 episodes. I don't know, this gives me really big Jabba's Palace and Return of the Jedi vibes. It's something the previous installment made a really big deal of setting up, so it can't be ignored. However, it has nothing to do with the story the current installment is trying to tell, so it just kind of happens and is then swept aside. I mean, at least in Jedi, that's in service to a character who features prominently for the rest of the movie. Besides my guess that the writers agree with me that Oob is stronger as a setup than as a character, I feel like this is a consequence of GT jumping ahead in time. The time skip here makes total sense, but it's always seemed so strange to me when you place it in context. The narrative introduces all these new designs for every character, only to immediately replace them before anything of consequence has even happened to them. Toriyama's ending is structured as a tease at a new storyline. As in, the last few chapters feel like they're starting a new story, only to then reveal you're going to have to imagine that story for yourself. So that's why all of these exist, to give you, the reader, the introduction you need to carry on the rest of the story. Obviously, GT would be starting out fully in Toriyama's shadow if they simply decided to tell that story. And like Morishita said, he thought it would be disrespectful if they told their story within Toriyama's framework. And they felt that way in regards to setting their story in the unused 10-year gap after the fight with Majin Buu. How much worse would it be to go, well, Toriyama said you have to imagine this story, but we're here to say, screw that. So I understand why they decided to just jump over that entirely. But that knowledge doesn't keep this from feeling incredibly jarring. They so heavily set up this new character in the adventures he's going to have with Goku, only to jump ahead the next week and go, Those adventures sure were fun! Well, buh bye Oob! It would be like Future Trunks warning all the heroes about Dr. Garrow, and then we skip ahead to see the characters going, Wow, that cell sure was tough! Jeez, I'm over a thousand words into this script and I haven't even gotten past the first couple of scenes of the first episode. Don't expect that to change when it comes to the very next thing I'm going to talk about. Hey, remember when I started the Boo arc and I had to give that spiel about how the beginning of a story sets up so many things to talk about so that dissecting it takes a really long time? You do? Good. Deep within the temple, Pilaf explains to his cronies that there are another set of Dragon Balls that have been here this whole time that no one has ever thought to mention before now. Pilaf calls them Ultimate Dragon Balls, Kaio calls them Black Star Dragon Balls at the end of the episode. These whatever Dragon Balls are apparently even stronger than the regular Dragon Balls because they were made before Piccolo Daimao and God split into two people when they were at their full power. You know, you're young, you're crazy, you experiment a little, you... hold on to people's skeletons. Okay, what is up with all the skeletons? When Kaio explained that this Namekian was corrupted by the violence of Earthlings, I thought he meant he wasn't perfectly pure enough to be a literal god. I didn't know he spent his entire life covering up that he was a serial killer who held on to the bones of his victims as trophies. What in the world are they trying to tell us here? I mean, yeah, I get that Piccolo killed people, but I always assumed that was after the split, when he was untethered from the morals and inhibitions of his good half. I mean, look, if I murder someone with a gun I hold in my right hand, I can't just cut off my right hand and say, look, I purged myself of the part that murdered somebody, therefore I can no longer be held responsible. Jeez, no wonder Garlic Sr. was pissed off that he got passed over in favor of the guy who literally brought his murder shrine with him to his new job. All this nonsense is for a throwaway gag, that being that Shu freaks out over the bones while nobody else notices them. I get that they're supposed to suggest that these Dragon Balls are in some way threatening, but I feel like there was no thought put into the serious implications this creates for certain characters. And I know, this is a lot of time to spend on something that appears for just a few seconds, and they never expected someone like me who overthinks everything would come along decades later, but come on, storytelling! 
That makes the next thing I'm about to say sound like small potatoes, but as long as we're here. If Namekian Dude made Dragon Balls before he split into two people, why does Piccolo not know what Dragon Balls are before Pilaf explains them to him? Apparently, seeking inspiration from earlier stories didn't involve rereading the Piccolo arc. Obviously, my mind is racing here. So many thoughts, so many opinions. This is Dragon Ball Dissection, not Dragon Ball Plot Synopsis. You know the drill. At the end of the day, this isn't that important. I just think it's fun to talk about. This is indeed an ass pull to quickly establish a new set of powers. For a franchise that has been around for 10 years at this point, hitting a few hurdles is almost inevitable. But still, skeletons, why? Just why? Seemingly inspired by my reminding him that they always seem to have their plans ruined just before they succeed, Pilaf wastes no time and summons Shenlong right then. At the temple. Which almost guarantees they're going to be caught. <sighs> There's only so much minutia I can get bogged down in. I want to keep this tiny bit of forward momentum going. They're inept comedy villains, so I can accept them doing something this painfully stupid for the sake of the plot. I like this new Shenlong design. The red coloring does wonders to make him seem more powerful and a bit ominous. So yes, as should be obvious, Goku walks in on Pilaf after he has summoned Shenlong because he noticed the sky get dark. Yes, that is indeed a telltale sign. I would imagine, though, that creepy red dragon directly above him might catch his eye just a little bit more. Goku is tickled at this reunion. Pilaf is annoyed at how strong Son Goku is now and reminisces about how he was easier to beat when he was a little kid. Proving just how much of a dick this red makeover makes him, Shenlong decides to interpret that as a wish and turns Goku into a child. Look, all I'm going to say is, this shoddy form of wish-making would never fly with the goblins from Labyrinth. This is not how you summon David Bowie. Now that Goku is transformed, that reminds me that I probably shouldn't put this off any longer. Remember the contest to win a Super Saiyan 4 Son Goku SH Figure Arts collectible? Well, rest assured, the winner already has the prize. But given how busy I was concluding DBD TV and starting this up, I never actually announced it. So let's do that. The goal here was to ditch the Super Saiyan 4 moniker and come up with a better name instead. There were so many great entries, and here are the five finalists. From Patrick, It is well known that Ozaru is Japanese for Great Primate. Thus, this form's name must undoubtedly be Kozaru, from the Japanese word for little, Ko. From Miles Bell, Furious George. From Kibom, Super Saiyan Fur. From Cory Watson, Assuming we're supposed to be convinced that GT happens after Super, like the stories are totally compatible, then this is Super Saiyan Great Ape Super Saiyan, or Super Saiyan Black for short. And finally, from Yu-Gi-Oh! Ragnarok, Mighty Monkey Power Levels. The winner, as chosen by patrons, is... Miles Bell with Furious George! Everyone loves a good pun. Thanks so much for entering, everybody, and congratulations to you, Miles. Hope you are enjoying your Furious George Son Goku figure. And now, back to the dissecting. So now that Goku is a kid and much easier to beat, Pilaf and company waste no time killing him, finally paying him back for all those years he humiliated them. Oh no, wait. They just disappear without any explanation at all. The first few minutes of Dragon Ball GT certainly makes some weird, sloppy choices. Oob disappearing, Pilaf disappearing, those spooky, scary skeletons for no reason. However, as easy as it is to get lost in the details, as I have clearly been doing, they are relatively unimportant when placed in service to the big picture. We don't really need to see what happens to Pilaf because it's not that important. They presumably scurry off in defeat? Dende finally activates the temple's security systems to eject them? Okay, that one would be important because if it finally happened and I didn't get to see it, I'm going to cry. Pilaf, Shu, and Mai opening the series serves to indicate that this is going to be different from Dragon Ball Z. And of course, these opening episodes serve to introduce and establish our lead characters. 
Goku is obviously the first of those leads, and the series wastes no time tying up his loose ends before hitting him with the narrative's inciting incident. And it's an inciting incident I've always loved. I have so missed Son Goku as a kid. To me, Goku as a child is his most iconic representation. So as controversial as this shift might be, I am fully on board with this. The idea seems to be that it will limit what he can do, which is fantastic. Again, it's that philosophy of realizing they can't outdo the ridiculous escalation of late Dragon Ball, so they're finding ways to de-escalate. Making Goku a kid also helps balance his role within the series. While he's deferred to by the other characters to some degree, he's just a goofy kid. And he's less inclined to be up in everyone's business taking control of things. He's no longer this distant savior figure who only shows up to save the day. He's in the thick of things again, part of a group. A character, not a device. We'll see how long this holds up, but for now, it's a great idea to start on. So apparently these new old Dragon Balls are so evil and dangerous that even Kaio immediately knows something about them. Mr. Popo knows them too, and knows that unlike the other Dragon Balls, these scatter across the entire flippin' universe. So, Mr. Popo knows about these. Which means he presumably knows about the mass grave artfully hidden under a sheet. What is wrong with you people? But Goku, immediately being awesome-tastic, isn't really bothered by being a kid again. He decides to go home. And by go home, I mean he goes to a city to eat lots of food. It just so happens that at the same time, Kame Senin is also in this city traumatizing poor young women by sexually assaulting them. He also assaults us with his new voice. And I want to keep moving forward, but since Kame Senin is barely in this series at all, I can't really put it off until later. As I've mentioned a few times this year, Mia Uchi Kohei, his longtime performer, passed away during the Boo arc. While Sato Masaharu took over his duties for Movie 13 and would eventually become the permanent replacement in 21st Century Dragon Ball, Masuoka Hiroshi provided a brief bit of vocalizing for him in his last speaking appearance in Dragon Ball Z. This, however, is his first time voicing him to any noticeable degree. And I'm not a huge fan. He just comes across as way too cartoony and squeaky. It's very much a stereotypical fake old man voice. It's fine enough for this rather silly and goofy cameo, but I just can't imagine him having the range that Miyauchi gave him. Kame Senin's role here is to pass the torch, to recognize Goku as that child he knew so long ago, and ultimately, to reintroduce him to our second main character, Pan. Pan is on a date with this guy in a sorry now printing shirt. What a winner. If she is nine, though, it seems rather weird she's going about town on her own on a date. But hey, if I can accept a four-year-old living by himself in the wilderness, I think I can accept a nine-year-old dating a boy. Unfortunately, a bank is being robbed at that exact same time. It's unfortunate for Pond because it prevents them from getting to their movie. And here's that DB irreverence, which is wonderful when handled with the right amount of balance. Pond is going to jump in and do the right thing, saving the day from the evil bank robbers slash hostage takers. But she is a self-centered child, and she's really only doing it in order to facilitate what she wants, continuing her date. Because the stakes are relatively low, and she is a child, it comes across as silly and charming, rather than devastatingly horrific. In the meantime, though, this weird little kid keeps trying to get in the way, and Pan has to continually stop him, she has no time for stupid little kids. With the day saved, she tries to return to her date, but the moron freaks out and ghosts her. What. A. Loser. Jeez, you deserve better than this lame ass whose masculinity is this fragile. This is a fantastic establishing character moment. It tells us so much about Pan with relatively little. She's super strong. She longs to be treated like an adult while at the same time being fairly immature and she's a forceful personality who tends to get what she wants. Based solely on this episode, though, I wondered if they were going to play with her insecurities. She implies this isn't the first time a boy has rejected her because of something like this. And while I'm not terribly keen to have her saddled with the stereotype of having to diminish herself for the ego of boys, 
I wouldn't necessarily mind the broader idea that she's embarrassed by her talents. Going off that, pairing her with her happy, easygoing grandfather could give her the boost she needs to appreciate her talents and come into her own. Sadly, this doesn't ever really go anywhere, so print job loser is just a loser for no real narrative reason. Loser. Unlike the quick discarding of Oob, seeing Pawn here meshes quite well with her brief introduction at the end of the previous series. Rather than the 28th Budokai representing a story we never see, it's recontextualized as a prologue to the character of Pawn, showing just how much things have changed in the past five years. She's no longer quite the same sweet, wide-eyed little girl she was then. Like most kids burgeoning into adolescence, she feels held back and embarrassed by her parental figures. And so we have a Pawn who no longer idolizes her grandpa, but is now annoyed and embarrassed by him. And I know some of this is simply her age, and the weirdness of her grandpa being a silly, occasionally naked kid. But looking at the end of DB as prologue to GT, even though the series never says so, I have to wonder if there is intended to be some unstated bitterness coming from her. Remember that the animated version added moments of Pawn in tears that her beloved grandfather was abandoning her. And my use of the word abandoning is not hyperbole. Just taking Toriyama's Dragon Ball on its own, you could always assume that training Oob was Goku's day job, and he regularly, or at least occasionally, returned home to his family. Here in GT, though, Goku explicitly says that he hasn't seen them in years. So, yeah, if I was Pawn, I wouldn't have any affection for this stupid little kid either. Whatever the reason, I think her dismissive attitude works for this story. The animosity Pawn has for Goku gives them somewhere to go, a character journey to complement the external journey the story is building towards. Back at the Son family home, the others are reacting to Goku's sudden change in the expected ways. Goku still doesn't see the big deal, but suddenly Kaio chimes in. These body count Dragon Balls are even worse than they thought. Not only do they travel across the entire universe, if they're not brought back to their place of origin within a year, the entire planet will explode. Seriously, what is wrong with you? Oh, jeez. It took me an entire episode just to get through an entire episode. Well, it's a good thing I have four more weeks left of Dragon Ball Die Section December to make progress through this story arc. So next week, we'll be reintroduced to the third member of our group. And you can see it right now as a $10 and up patron. There are reward tiers at every level, and I always appreciate the support. Let me know what you think, and let me know what topics you want to make sure I don't miss in this new DBD GT. See you next time!